Welcome to this presentation on leverage points for transformative change. Um, I'm basing most of this presentation on an article called Leverage Points for Sustainability Transformation by um, Abzan et al. from 2017, so pretty new uh, research. And um, I have some background in sustainability sciences from my undergrad, which I did at the Leuphana University in Lüneburg, where um, he is also a professor. First of all, maybe I, I want to say a word about what is transformative change or like, is there such a thing as untransformative change? Um, so transformative change is just change that uh, actually leads to um, a transformation in society, whereas untransformative change would be change that um, affects small changes within the system, but doesn't really change the system per se. And I want to start with this quote by uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, never before have we had so little time in which to do so much. It's just important to keep that always in the back of our, our minds as researchers, um, that we do not have time for untransformative change. We do not have time to have our research sit in a shelf for 10 years. Uh, we do not have time for research that doesn't affect large changes because we need changes and we need big changes fast in order to basically <laughs> save our own asses. So um, that's really also what the whole field of sustainability science is trying to do is really to get uh, research out there that can affect important big changes in society so that we can um, move towards a more sustainable future. So I want to give some um, definitions, first of all. Um, first of all, sustainability science. Um, what is that at all? So one of the definitions is that it's a field of research which deals with interactions between natural and social systems and with how those interactions affect the challenge of sustainability. Um, and that challenge is meeting the needs of present and future generations while substantially reducing poverty and conserving the planet's life support systems. And with this challenge, we can already gather that this is a very complex field of, uh, of science and research because it's, uh, it spans a massive area. We see straight away, it's, uh, it's the interface between natural sciences and social sciences. And it is something that reaches from the present into the future. A Little bit of history. So there, there was a bibliometric analysis um, that sh shed a lot of light on where sustainability science actually originated. And we see that beginning in the 1990s, basically the scientific articles um, featuring the word sustainability grow rapidly and then they double about every eight years. I would imagine by now the doubling rate is probably even bigger. And um, interestingly, uh, it's a worldwide scientific movement, so it goes beyond the centers of traditional science, which would be um, you know, the Western world um, and Japan, um, the USA and the big universities uh, where, where we, a lot of our research is created, whereas with sustainability sciences, we have hubs in South America, we have um, publications coming from Africa, so it's a very um, worldwide movement. Also, the research often originates in political centers rather than traditional science centers. So it doesn't necessarily come out of the big universities. It's often, uh, you can see that there are clusters and capitals, for example. And if you look at the papers, you have about a third of papers um, appearing in social science journals, about a quarter in biological journals, and about a fifth in engineering journals. So there you see also the mix of the disciplines. Um, you can also see that uh, from about 2000 onwards, there's a certain research network emerging where you see that the authors of the articles kind of start cross publishing and um, you see that there's a certain research community um, starting to, to emerge from this. Um, there's a strong political dimension to the whole thing because uh, this whole sustainable development concept is a political concept which emerged in the early 80s from, uh, from scientific perspectives on the um, into the dependence of society and environment. That was all kicked off, of course, in 1972 in Stockholm with the UN Conference on the Human Environment um, 
And then the Brundtland report from 1980 kind of kicked that uh, into gear and it entered the high political agenda. And then with the uh, UN conference in Rio in 92, um, it became like a, a really, really important point in politics. Um, but even though it was a great political success, actually many scientists initially found it really difficult to, to conceptualize it and to measure sustainable development and, and make, it, make it a subject of real scientific inquiry. However, by now it's been around for a while and we do have um, formulated major research questions in sustainability sciences, um, all sort of centered around um, the, the human environment systems. And what is meant by that is basically the, the thousands of interactions between humans and um, the natural environment. We have uh, a very, very broad scope um, where we're looking at long-term trends and transitions. We're looking at adaptability, vulnerability, resilience of these human environment systems. We're looking um, for a way of modeling um, variations in, in interactions. Um, we're looking at trade-offs between human well-being and the natural environment. For example, the whole sort of uh, ecosystem services concept would fall in there. And we're looking at uh, how can we have a transition to more sustainability and then how could we actually evaluate the, the pathways that we're taking. So making sure they're really sustainable, leading to a sustainable system. And is there a way to, um, to define limits that would provide effective warning uh, when a human environment system is really um, starting to fail? And uh, one of these, just one example um, of research done into that was uh, the concept of the planetary boundaries by uh, a group of scientists around Johann Rockström in Stockholm, developed 2009, um, where they were trying to define limits, earth system limits, where um, they were trying to define after what point we're kind of crossing a threshold and certain um, stable states get changed and, the and there's a big system change. So that was just one of these ideas of um, defining limits scientifically that would give warnings. And if you look at what they did, um, it's, it's looking uh, not so good for, for the biosphere. It's looking, looking not good for the biochemical flows. Climate change is already going uh, yellow as well. And a lot of the stuff that looks better is, has just not been uh, quantified yet. So we don't really know what's going on there. So that's just one um, example of, of uh, an output of sustainability science. Then the next big point will be transdisciplinarity. So transdisciplinarity means two or more, mostly more discipline uh, perspectives transcend each other to form a new holistic approach. Now, what does that mean and how does that relate to uh, multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity? Multidisciplinarity means that we have different disciplinary perspectives and we add them up. So the disciplines each provide their viewpoint on a problem from their perspectives, which means um, there is very little interaction actually across disciplines. It just means that you, you throw your knowledge together in a way that everyone just gives their opinion out of their own viewpoint towards a problem or a solution. Interdisciplinarity combines disciplines to a level of integration. So that means some, some boundaries start to break down. It's not just an addition of parts, but actually the recognition that each discipline can in turn affect research output of another discipline. So the inputs actually, actually influence uh, the output of the research. So it's a, it's a joint effort. Um, and transdisciplinarity is when discipline perspectives actually kind of overlay and layer uh, to form a whole new holistic approach. So it's basically creating output um, as a result of these disciplines integrating to become something completely new. So you bring different um, disciplines into the mix and from the beginning of a project, you kind of define that you're just going to use all the knowledge that these people coming from the single discipline have, but from the beginning, they're gonna throw it together and they're gonna create something new out of all of that that they're bringing with them. And that way they will be far more able to um, apply all of that to a very complex problem or situation because they can um, draw on so many different avenues of thinking and so many different approaches and all of that coming together can then form actually a new field of practice. So that's transdisciplinarity. So this obviously um, needs a lot of 
capacity building as far as the uh, researchers are concerned who are involved in that, um, this transdisciplinary approach. Because what it wants to do is it enables inputs and, and scoping across scientific and non-scientific stakeholder communities. Um, so this is scientific and non-scientific. That's the first thing. We, we are actually dissolving the hierarchies between scientific and non-scientific knowledge. Everything is important in a transdisciplinary approach. Um, and we need to be aware of that a lot of researchers and also a lot of non-scientific stakeholders won't be used to this type of working together. So we need a really open uh, discussion, a really open dialogue where everything is given equal weight, every perspective is given equal weight and is then related to each other. And this is very difficult because um, people aren't used to, the, to thinking that way. So we need to build that capacity. We also have an overwhelming amount of information. Very often it's very hard to, to structure it. And also, of course, every single field comes with its own specialized language and that doesn't make it easier either to actually work together. So there are a lot of things to think about and where really you need to first build the research capacity at all in order to be able to do transdisciplinary disciplinary work. And the ultimate goal of that is the understanding of the present world, which cannot be accomplished in the framework of disciplinary research. And this is something that um, Nicoleshu said, and he is actually a theoretical physicist. Um, so he, he really has like pure science, but he is also the president and founder of the International Center for Transdisciplinary Research and Studies, and also co-founder of the study group of on transdisciplinarity at the UNESCO. So um, there you can see that this is not just environmental sciences and social sciences. It's really the idea is that you're integrating all that there is and everyone brings an important piece of knowledge and an important way of thinking into the big mix. Now, and the next thing I wanna uh, spend some time on is systems thinking. Um, and that relates directly to transdisciplinarity. Um, because if we're looking at these big complex challenges of sustainability science that we can only tackle through transdisciplinary work, uh, we can already see that we need to be thinking in huge systems. Um, and systems thinking is an approach that's based on the belief that the component parts, so every single part of a system will act differently when they're isolated from the system's big environment or, or the other parts of the system. So it basically means you need to look at the whole system in order to understand what these parts are doing and why they're doing it. Um, simple example, if you look, uh, if you want to study crab behavior and um, you want to see how does a crab react when you put a bigger crab in front of it. Uh, now, if you have to crab in their normal uh, natural environment, there's going to be a, a whole lot of things that influence the way that this crab acts. So there's going to be ways that it can hide or that it can't hide. There's going to be other animals around. Some of them are going to be predators, others are going to be prey. Um, there, there's going to be water temperature, tides. Uh, it's a really, really dynamic system. And this crab is just kind of acting within that system. So when it meets another bigger crab, there's going to be so many things that influence the way it reacts in that very situation. Now, if you put the two crabs just in a, in a research tank with nothing else, but just the two crabs, then obviously you're taking everything away uh, that would normally influence this crab and it's going to act very differently from when, if it were within its system. So then you can ask, well, does it really, is this really gonna tell me anything about crab behavior? And this would be a typical reductionist approach, which in a lot of natural sciences is kind of what we're used to because we're kind of, coming from a way very often where you want to break things down to their single components. You want to simplify things so that you can understand, um, if you say like, if you just simplify it enough and understand the single parts, and then we put them back together, then we're gonna understand the system. But that's not what's going to happen because the system has its own dynamics and you cannot understand the system by understanding just the single parts. So, um, that's really what, what systems thinking is all about. It's, it's, it concerns an understanding of a system by examining exactly these linkages and interactions between the elements that comprise the system as a whole. We need to shift our mindset away from this linear thinking to circular thinking. Um, so in an event-oriented linear thinking, um, you just have these typical causal chains of events. You have root causes, A and B. So if A and B happens, then C happens, and then C leads to D. That's a nice, simple setup. Um, 
and and we can kind of we can see why reductionist um, approach is is a uh, is popular and also of course works if you want to break down things and kind of get a general overview. However, um, in systems systems theory really has been a major breakthrough in understanding how to manage more and more complex multi stakeholder situations because it's helping people to see the overall structures and patterns and cycles and systems rather than just seeing the single components and that way we can also identify of course solutions better so in systems thinking you see that there are no individual root single root causes but you're just thinking in these big feedback loops where a influences b and b influences c and c influences d and that influences a again and then there's still e and there's overlaying feedback loops and everything is always in the flow and reacting with one another and this whole system is really something you cannot pin down to such a linear kind of experience at all since everything's interconnected and there are these constant feedback loops, we can basically, we're just observing and trying to understand these feedback loops and try to intervene. Once we understand their dynamic, we can try to intervene into these feedback loops. There are two different types of feedback loops, reinforcing and balancing feedback loops. Um, reinforcing ones are the bad ones, basically, um, simplified, simplified uh, version, and balancing ones are the good ones. Reinforcing is when um, elements in the system reinforce more of the same. So for example, if you have a pond and you have a, you have a si situation where you have too many nutrients in there and then you have algae growth and then the algae um, again uh, decomposes and adds more nutrients to the ponds and you get more algae growth and then somewhere you just have a, an ecologically dead pond, um, that would be reinforcing feedback loops. Whereas balancing feedback loops is when elements within the system balance things out. Um, this would be the typical ideal uh, predator-prey relationship in nature where predator and prey numbers always balance each other out and none of them ever becomes dominant. However, if you take too, out too much of one, then the other one would, uh, would be getting dominant and you'd all of a sudden have a reinforcing feedback loop. This is the basic definition of what a system is. And I wanted to put that in here because Donella Meadows is really the, the mother of systems thinking. Um, so a system is a set of related components that work together in a particular environment to perform whatever functions are required to achieve the system's objective. Now it might be a bit surprising that a system can have an objective and that kind of depends on, uh, or that, that kind of has to do with that there are different ways of defining what a system is. Um, so if you're looking at social systems, for example, you can say they have a type of obje objective. Um, if you would look at, at capitalism as a system, for example, you could say what's the, the objective is to um, enhance wealth of the people who are participating in it, at least of some of them. Um, of course, other systems, natural systems, can't you can't really say they have an objective, or maybe you can. There's actually a philosophical question or discussion around that. But that's a, just a, a baseline definition. And Donella Meadows was um, extremely important to this whole thing. She um, wrote an essay in 1999 called Leverage Points, Places to Intervene in the System, which basically just uh, kicked this all off. Um, she also founded the Sustainability Institute in 1996, which combined research um, with practical demonstrations of, of how to live sustainable. And they're still around, actually. They're called Academy for Systems Change now, and there's going to be a link uh, later on. And I suggest you check it out because it's quite cool what they're doing there. Now, what we're trying to do in systems thinking is we're trying to get an overview over these systems. And how do you get an overview over things? You map them. So there are a million ways you can actually map systems. It's one of the key tools um, that we have. Um, and you can do very many different ways of looking at it. You can look sort of at, for example, if you have um, a certain social system with uh, certain behaviors that are go governed by certain norms, and then you notice they change over time, you could do a behavior over time graph with that. You could look at an iceberg type model where you look at certain events, you try to see the patterns below these events, you try to see the structures below the patterns, and then you try to find out what mental models actually lead to these structures and so on. But what they all have in common is that you try to identify and map the elements of stuff within a system to understand how that all interconnects and how they relate to each other. And, uh, and then eventually how to change the system in the most 
effective way. So you can choose how to map it, but your, your goal is always going to, going to be to understand the system and then um, find out how to change the system in the most effective way. And this is where the concept of leverage points comes into play. Um, and because I can't see anyone on my screen, I would just like someone to say, um, yes, I'm still here and I'm still following. <laughs> I'm still here and still following. Thank you. <laughs> Say, <laughs> great, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so um, I said earlier that there are two different ways of looking at systems and that's what makes it not easier when you're talking about it. Um, there's an ontological and an epistemological way, fancy words. Um, ontological just means that systems are viewed as just real world phenomena that can be objectively studied. These are often um, natural systems like um, our planet is a single system comprising all sorts of complex interactions between humans and nature. And then there's the, the other way that's basically saying systems thinking is like a lens through which you can address sustainability issues and there the researcher actually defines what the system is that he's looking at. So he can, he or she, uh, sorry, can make the decision to look at certain aspects and say, this is the system that I'm looking at now. Um, and of course that then becomes very subjective uh, and that doesn't, um, it doesn't make it easier, but it sometimes is just necessary because obviously we cannot just always look at the whole planet. Uh, that would not also not be like the right way of, of approaching this challenge. Um, so moving on to the concept of leverage points, when you're in complex situations like that, and I, I think that came across, it's a very complex things that we're dealing with. Um, it's very useful to move beyond thinking of just a change that will fix the system um, and instead it's better to try to look for, for a whole number of leverage points that you could adjust to improve that system. Um, get away from a one size fits all approach that is very common in linear thinking where you're just trying to say like, this is the root cause, I'm going to do A and uh, then this is going to just have this one effect. And, uh, and then every time I encounter this problem, I'm gonna do exactly that one thing and that's always going to fix it. Um, but since systems are always in motion and adapting, uh, that, that just won't work. Um, and also what's really important when you want to have leverage points that are actually effective is that the way you deliver, but also already the, the way that you envision solutions, that that must reflect one of the, the values and the context and the cultures of all the different communities of stakeholders, because otherwise, um, if you do something that's completely sort of out of their system, um, then they just won't let it in basically. Like then you can't, you can't really get a foot in, you can't really get your lever in um, because uh, it just doesn't fit, if that makes sense. And then the point is basically that what you want to find are the places where a small shift may lead to very fundamental changes in the system, because it's all like we said, we don't have much time um, and we want to be efficient um, and also how we spend our energy and our research energy and our research, um, our research budget. Drawing on the ideas that Meadows first put out there, um, Epson and his colleagues in that article I'm basing this on, um, basically bring forth this core argument that many sustainability interventions that we're seeing at the moment actually address essentially weak leverage points. So it's interventions that are pretty easy to make, but then have very limited potential for transformational change, which means, for example, this whole carbon market, like buying um, emissions, uh, that, that whole idea of trading carbon emissions, um, that's pretty easy to implement because you know, there's, there's, it's basically based within this capitalistic system. And then you can say, well, you know, if you, if you have these emissions and then you can sort of offset them. So this whole idea of carbon offsetting, it's, it's sort of, it's easy, you can, you can um, implement it, but in the end, it doesn't really change the behavior because now people can just like have a, a big carbon footprint, but then they do some carbon offsetting and then it looks good again on their business report in the end. Um, so this is, is not transformational change. This is a, a tiny sort of little thing you can do, but it doesn't really help. It doesn't really change the system. So what we need to focus on really is more to find more powerful areas of intervention. Um, and they center that around three realms of leverage, which is reconnecting people to nature, 
restructuring institutions and rethinking how knowledge is created and used in pursuit of sustainability. Now there's a whole a whole discussion going on about this term reconnecting people to nature, because this is like a philosophical and important discussion where um, we can never be disconnected from nature because we are part of nature. And this whole idea that humans are somehow apart from nature is just a very old philosophical idea coming from antique philosophers. Um, and that is very harmful because if we don't see ourselves as part of nature, then that means that we kind of have this user attitude towards it potentially. Um, so there is a whole, a whole discussion around this reconnecting term and if that's a good term because we shouldn't really, there isn't really a, uh, a way to disconnect people from nature really. Um, but of course there is, uh, it's a fact that there are people who feel disconnected from nature. So. And this also affects that reconnecting people to nature does have the, the power to change things in systems and in, in the thinking of people. But just to alert you to that there is a problem with that term and that is being discussed. And of course, we need systems thinking in, in order to, to find these leverage points. I think that has probably become clear because it takes a systemic view of these sustainability issues rather than breaking them down into a series of just discrete elements that you then address separately um, rather than seeing how they work within the, the big system. Um, now I'm just gonna quickly take you through this. This is from um, basically the how Meadows set it up in her 1999 essay. Um, and she basically says there are just different places to intervene in the system. Some um, are powerful places of intervention and others are shallow, not so powerful places of intervention. Uh, all of these characteristics um, relate to different types of leverage points. So basically, um, way up there where it says parameters, um, these are very mechanistic characteristics. To, for example, taxes, incentives, standards, uh, physical elements of a system. So these are very sort of tangible things. They're quite easy to modify. Like you can, you can have a, a carbon tax, or you can introduce um, incentives for farmers to plant certain plants, or to not use uh, too much um, fertilizer or whatever. Then you've got the feedbacks, which would be the interaction between different elements within a system of interest. Um, the interactions that drive internal dynamics, for example, these feedback loops we were looking at earlier um, or also for example effectiveness of a given incentive so that's also still something that's relatively tangible where you can look at okay um, you know we could try to understand some of the feedback loops we can try to understand how effective an incentive or a tax was then you've got the design level which is the structure of the whole system how is the system designed how does information flow what are the rules of the system? What, what are the power hierarchies? What is the organizational structure of the system? So this would be a point where um, you could have very powerful interventions, but it's of course also harder to, uh, to get a grip on that. And then you've got the basis of the systems, which in, in social systems would be the norms, the values, the goals embodied within that system. And what are the underpinning paradigms um, out of which these norms arise. So basically you're looking at, if you want normative change, which is the most powerful type of change, but also the hardest type of change that you could aim for. But basically what this whole um, idea is, is that you have to dare to ask the big questions. If you wanna go for deep leverage points, it's, it's no good shying away from asking these big normative questions, from questioning normality to, to just really dare to do that and not shy away from that and think that it's out of your scope. So as a sustainability scientist, you need to be a bit bold and just go in there and say, I'm gonna go ahead and just question these, these basic uh, features of a system. Now there's quite a, a lot of existing research you can draw on if you're looking at leverage points. There is research on social ecological transitions. Um, there's uh, typologies that Ostrom um, drew up of uh, social ecological systems, which is really useful for leverage point research. There's a multi-level governance research, which kind of emphasizes an institutional approach to understand social ecological systems. 
Um, there's behavioral psychology, um, where we're looking at behaviors of individual actors and organizations within the system, which is really important because all systems are made, are of course, made up of individual actors. Um, there's resilience thinking, which is kind of thinking of systemic change and identity and reorganization. There are cyber systemics, which is kind of like looking at navigation or, or control of complex systems. And then there's transdisciplinary research, which basically provides, as we saw earlier, the methodologies for integrating knowledge, the, the capacity building for, um, for the scientific and social processes that we need to go through. So that's all stuff that we can draw from. Now, uh, Epson uh, and his colleagues define uh, three realms of deep leverage sustainability transformation, which would one would be the role of institutions and institutional decline and failure in systemic change, which they um, override with restructure people's connections to nature and their influences on sustainability outcomes, which would be the reconnect thing, and then knowledge production and use in transformational processes, which would be rethink. So this is like knowledge base. That, that's the three realms of leverage. And um, I'm just going to go through them one by one. So if we look at restructuring, um, all human society is structured around formal and informal institutions. Formal institutions are things like written rules, laws, regulations, agreements that, that are collectively binding for a society. Informal institutions would be customs, taboos, codes of conduct, things like that. Um, institutions are very powerful to harness change, but they are also self enforcing and very resistant to change as anyone who'd ever worked within an institution will probably know. They're not exactly fluid. Um, so it can be very difficult to harness institutional change for transformation. Interestingly, um, there hasn't really been much research into um, looking at processes of institutional failure and decline and how that could be productive. Most sustainability research so far has focused on um, institutional evolution or um, innovations. So to, to build new institutions that are better for sustainability. Um, but of course, crises can trigger institutional ad adaptations because uh, external and internal pressure is something that systems respond to with reorganization and adaptation. So um, in formal and informal institutions may reorganize or decline if you have a crisis situation. And the key lever here would be to ensure that institutions are designed to be open to that kind of transformational learning and adaptation, um, the opportunities that are invoked by crises. And there's very little research in that. And uh, that would be very helpful because, of course, we're looking at um, a future where we will have um, more and more crises. And if, if we have institutions that, um, if we can somehow profit from these crises as a, as, a, as a force. It can be almost a positive force in some ways. Of course, sometimes the, the aim could be to purposefully destabilize unsustainable institutions. But for that as well, we need to understand how they work because this is potentially very dangerous to, to destabilize um, and dismantle institutions. So it's a tricky approach and you really have to understand the institutions that you're looking at. Um, and you should also, just systematically analyze um, institutional failures in different contexts, and then maybe be able to, from that anal from that analysis, then garner understanding that you can use in the future. So it's basically it's, it's phrased as institutionalizing mechanisms of governance learning, um, so that you learn from failure, that you can then harness this potential of failure um, and basically turn it just into a potential for change. And that would also lead to the, the last point here, which would be the active management of decline. So if institutions decline um, due to crises, um, it could be a war, a revolution, but it all could also be a climate change leading to completely new situations. Um, if a, an institution changes very in a very uncontrolled way, uh, you always risk losing things that are actually 
important, like knowledge on networks or, or the capacity of the people who work in the institution. If you somehow manage this decline more proactively and you could try to, to alleviate some of these effects and still use some of, this, some of these elements that might be useful in a restructured institution. So that would be restructure. Reconnect, um, as I said, this is about basically reconnecting people to nature. A lot um, of research has been done on um, how in global systems, we rely more and more on distal ecosystems for provisions of our goods and services. So not anymore on the ecosystems that are really close to us, which for a lot of people then results in that they don't really feel part of their natural ecosystem anymore. And they don't really understand the, the interactions. So there has been a strong call for sort of the strengthening of this, these direct material links between people and, and nature and local ecosystems. This would be anything from eat, eating seasonal veggies, um, to, to sort of just interacting more with your local ecosystem rather than traveling to the Caribbean. Now with COVID, of course, there could be a, that this is again, that there's crises that could be chances. Like now we can't travel so we can reconnect with the ecosystem on our doorstep. Um, now, you know, like with Brexit, uh, maybe we need to eat more, more British food in, in England because all the other stuff isn't getting on, isn't getting in anymore because they're all queuing in Kent forever. So um, there, there are always ways to sort of use crises for development. And then there's, there's a whole lot of key, key areas of research that are also going into um, philosophy about just kind of how, how human nature connections are, what, what, how they are, how, how we perceive them, what kind of different um, human nature connections interact, how we can influence them. And uh, one example that I always really like, where you also see that philosophy is important. It's not, philosophy isn't just sort of a, a nice add-on for, uh, for people who have um, too much free time, but philosophy is really very, very basic. And I think a lot of natural scientists maybe sometimes shy away from that a bit and think it's just a lot of blah, blah, but it is really very important. Um, for example, if we look at the, uh, the concept of ecosystem services, which kind of embodies a production metaphor for human nature relationships. So nature provides goods and services for people to use. So it's very utilitarian. It's very based in a capitalist um, thinking. And we can then say, yes, this can be helpful in many ways, but we also need to contrast it with other metaphors. For example, one, one of the uh, ways you could contrast it with would be the concept of multi-species eco-justice, which is like completely different. And, um, and all of these discussions are important because um, to these, connected to these different philosophical perspectives um, are then moral and ethical obligations that then govern our appropriate actions towards the environment because this kind of stuff forms our moral backdrop. If we believe in one of these systems, then there can't, there's a certain package of actions that comes with that. So it's important to discuss that and to not just buy into one concept and say, oh yeah, ecosystem services, this is going to be the absolute key now that's going to um, be the, the thing that heals the world, but that you, know, you, you really discuss these things. And then to last point to rethink knowledge. Um, and this is really about how the way in which problems are framed and how knowledge is produced has very, very significant implications for policy development and societal outcomes. So rethinking knowledge, um, we really need to understand how does knowledge flow through our system? There's been a lot of talk um, about that we have problems with knowledge being elitist or that knowledge isn't accessible to everyone and this has to do with how knowledge is passed on in our system and could there not be different ways of passing on knowledge it also has to do with the idea of um legitimacy of knowledge um what whose knowledge is legitimate and whose knowledge isn't um there's been a, a big bias towards sort of like western european scientific type knowledge which is considered legitimate and then looking at for example traditional knowledge of uh, of indigenous peoples that has been perceived as less legitimate because it has been classed as non-scientific so this is all stuff where you question knowledge hierarchies and where you look at what what are the, the pathways that knowledge is really taking in our society and how could we, uh, what are the, uh, the limitations and what are the assumptions we have? Um, what are the barriers? So this is all about kind of questioning how do we learn things? How do we pass on knowledge? 
um, whose knowledge do we consider important, whose knowledge don't we consider important. And um, basically the, the, the key requirements of new forms of knowledge, knowledge production would really be that um, you kind of have a research approach that is not just uh, oriented towards producing knowledge per se, but that is really oriented, um, basically problem and solution oriented. Um, we need to have a focus on mutual learning processes between science and society. So rethinking the role of science and society, which is something that we're trying to do with the Plover Rovers by getting science and bringing science and society together, questioning these hierarchies of knowledge between science and society and trying to get um, people to interact and produce knowledge together. Uh, and then the inclusions of values, norms, and context characteristics into the research process to produce what is called socially robust knowledge, which means it's knowledge that will then actually be solution oriented because it's going to create interventions that will actually work, interventions that people will actually get behind because their values and their norms and their context has been considered when they were developed rather than creating something that sounds great on paper, but then just doesn't have an effect once you take it into real life. Um, so it's really breaking down these barriers between uh, science and society, um, which is of just one of the things that inspires us and the Plover Rovers. Um, so we are right here in that, uh, in that field of sustainability um, science, really, with, with that project. And there are some um, very clearly formulated research uh, needs there as well, which I'm going to kind of uh, fly over here. Um, but it basically all relates to assessing the way that we that we deal with knowledge in, in our current system and how we could improve it. Um, one caveat uh, that I wanted to put out there is that we're talking about levers or levers, actually, I'm never sure, and leverage points. And, and this is, of course, a very kind of mechanistic picture of like, we have this lever and then we press on it and then bam, something big happens. But of course, um, these systems are so complicated and complex that that there are no simple mechanistic relations so these different leverage points we're talking about are not independent from one another you can make one change then it influences the system again and then also the effectiveness of leverage points might change it might turn from an ineffective one into an effective one um, it can be all very unexpected and very confusing. Um, it's just important not to, again, not to fall into that trap of trying to simplify it, but always stay aware of that inherent complexity of everything that we're dealing with. That is also actually a really crucial research gap still, uh, potential interactions between deep and shallow leverage points. So that's something where there needs to be more research done on that. Um, and of course, again, systems thinking, do not study anything in isolation. Uh, to always kind of focus on the whole thing, but focusing explicitly on these deep leverage points where we saw it's about the design of the system and the underlying things in the system might then help uncover really important systemic relations. So the, the research focus definitely makes sense. These are the knowledge gaps we still have, which I'm also not going to uh, deal with in great detail here, but uh, it's basically, there's a lot of research there still to be done. And it's uh, potentially, if we have that research agenda centered on that concept of deep leverage points that can provide a, a very coherent framework for engagement with the root causes of unsustainability, because um, we are in a very unsustainable trajectory, which means that obviously something in the systems that we live in is deeply unsustainable. Um, otherwise, this wouldn't be happening. So we do need to find these root causes and we need to ask the important questions. Um, a leverage points framework um, will really be very helpful to multiple fields and disciplines that, uh, that help develop it and then can draw from it as well and has the potential to, re to help reveal key avenues to sustainability and, and just give us something that we can work with um, in this important field. Um, and I think I want, to, I want to end the whole thing on one example that I think is very impressive, which deals with, with food production. And that's, uh, that's um, the, the researchers in, uh, at the Leuphana University in Lüneburg have done a lot of research into food security. And um, one of the things that they are uh, using in that um, article is that 
it is considered a reasonable question for a conservation from a conservation biology perspective to ask how do we produce enough food with minimal impacts on biodiversity to meet changing diets that's a reasonable question but potentially there's more important questions like for example how do we change diets to minimize biodiversity impacts because then we don't actually need to look at food production which is what's been done mainly we can uh, look at not having to to have that type of food production because we've actually changed the underlying system. So again, dare to ask the big questions. Um, if we have, why, why do we have a system that uh, says that the hipsters in London have to eat their avocado toast every day? Of course, we can improve avocado production. Uh, that's important. Um, we shouldn't kind of shy away from, from smaller uh, quick fixes. Um, because they, they can, of course, improve things. But it's also important to ask what is the underlying system? Why is it like that at all? And what kind of attitudes are behind that? And how could we change it in a more fundamental way? And we're seeing that right now with um, the idea of a vegan diet being um, pushed more and more into the mainstream. And actually, scientists are also putting out research on, um, on that kind of idea of, uh, of a, a change in, in diet and that's something that maybe um, 10 years ago, you know, you, it wouldn't, I, I don't think that would have been possible. So we're seeing that kind of uh, development there. And I want to end it with a quote, another quote, this time an old one by Alfred Lord Tennyson, who said, so many worlds, so much to do, so little done, such things to be. This is my suggested reading. Um, great essay has everything I said in it, basically. Um, and there's some useful links here. I'm happy to share these slides. Um, and this is also going to go up on YouTube. Um, these are all the references. So there's a lot of a lot of very interesting literature relating to all of this. Yes, you survived. Amazing. <laughs> I'm conscious that there was almost an hour of intense input. But does anyone have any questions? Are you just completely like lying on the floor, banging your head against the wall? everyone's asleep I, I i don't have any questions um but it, it was it was really interesting and informative it's just a very as you said thick topic but there were some really interesting points made um and i like the example at the end also about switching the thinking of it um to do with diet thank you um for that